So have you guys been encouraged by our study in Ecclesiastes so far? Right? I mean, how could you not be? And if you're new or you're jumping in with us kind of midstream here in Ecclesiastes, we've been looking at all kinds of just really uplifting, encouraging things like your life is short and you're going to die soon, right? And then once you do that, give it a little bit of time, and then nobody's going to remember who you even were, right? Just really uplifting stuff, right? Uh, and in the meantime, there's going to be a lot of injustice, oppression, greed in the world that you're not going to really be able to solve or fix. And in the midst of all the ups and downs, twists and turns and seasons of life, you have no control over that. Just another Sunday, you know, with your spirit lifted up with those things. And obviously I say that uh, somewhat tongue in cheek because these are true things that God wants us to think about. And there is a purpose for those things. There's actually freedom in accepting those realities because it starts to teach us to discern between what is important and what is not. It helps us to realize that so much of what the world is running after, chasing after, is not worth it. And it begins to point us to the things that are worthy, the things that are truly important. And one thing uh, that we have seen so far, clearly this is leading us to the conclusion that One thing that's often overvalued is stuff. People care way too much about their stuff, and they spend so much time trying to get more money to get more stuff, when in the end, they will leave it all. I was struck by this yesterday. I was leaving my house at 8 a.m., note that time, 8 o'clock in the morning, I was leaving my house, and I get to the end of my street, and I see more cars at the end of my street than I've ever seen as long as I have lived here. I mean, what in the world is going on? What are all these people doing here at 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning? And then I saw a sign that said, estate sale, 9 a.m., right? So even an hour before, they're literally circled around the block for this estate sale. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying estate sales are wrong or that you shouldn't go to estate sales ever. I was just saying the picture of that, right? Here's this person, they're dead and gone, and now all their stuff is up for sale, and people are lining up around the block for it. And give it a few more years, and some of that stuff is going to end up in their estate sales, right? It's stuff, it's here, and then it's it's gone. And we need to realize that. And one thing that Ecclesiastes is going to direct us to, away just from the pursuit of more stuff, is towards investing in people. When it thinks about material things, it's, it's a mist, it's a vapor. But when it comes to, to people, well, now we're talking about something with more substance to it. And we're going to see more of that today as we continue our study, this time in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. So take your Bibles, open up to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, where today we're going to look at verses 7 through 16. Ecclesiastes 4, 7 through 16. And we're kind of slowing down a little bit in our study because in those early passages, it sets some pretty big things, sets the big picture for us, you know, of those things that life is short, we don't have control, so we need to trust in God, we need to be content with what he has given us and even enjoy that, be faithful in that. But now it starts to get into some more specific things where it's like, okay, that that sounds good, enjoy life, be content, but what about all the injustice, oppression, and greed I see out there? In the world. And God's solution is well, hey, start with your corner of the world that you've been given responsibility for, and not only be faithful in that, but be content with that. That, That's the start. And that idea of really even thinking about our work and our responsibility, that's kind of the bridge into our topic today, where we'll look at not just work, but also then relationships and how we should think through those. So let's read our text together, follow along, starting in Ecclesiastes 4 7. Again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil. And his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow." But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they can keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. 
A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who, knew, who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he had been poor. I saw all the living who move about under the sun, along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and a striving after wind. So you see there, it gets to talk about you know, relationships there, especially in verses 9 through 12, but it starts again on that theme of work because it gives you this picture of this person that is working so hard. This guy, he's burning the candle at both ends, but he's all alone. And it makes it clear, what does this guy care about? He cares about money. He wants more money so he can get more stuff, but he's got nobody to share that stuff with. And it says, well, this is vanity. Remember, that word vanity literally means, you know, a mist or a vapor. And what, what's this guy doing? He's trying to grab a fistful of the mist. That doesn't work, Ecclesiastes is reminding us. It says this is an unhappy business. And that brings us back to what we've seen. One of the themes of Ecclesiastes, as one writer put it, life is gift, not gain. We receive the things that we have as a gift from God, not as a means just to twist them and get more for our Selves. But that's what this guy's doing. He's all alone, working just for his own benefit. Another writer put it pretty well, I thought, in painting the picture of this guy, saying he could buy dinner for everyone in the restaurant, but no one wants to sit with him. That's all right, because he doesn't want to sit with them either, right? He's got all the stuff, but he's got no one to share it with. But what we're going to see is while stuff and the money, that's not what's important, what it's going to pivot to in Verses 9 and beyond is, well, people, that's something that is important. So put this down for point number one this morning. Work ultimately for people, not profit. Work ultimately for people, not profit. And before you business majors in the room remind me, well, if you don't have a profit, you're going to go bankrupt, and then what can you do for people? Notice the word ultimately in there, Right? Obviously, for a business to be successful, yes, it needs to make a profit. But we're talking about what is the ultimate goal? And not just in a hypothetical business. I'm talking about you and your life. Is the priority on people or is it on profit? And it describes this guy in verse 8 saying, His eyes are never satisfied with riches. The, the world wants to sell you a lie that more money equals a better life or the good life, where Ecclesiastes has been saying, no, because you're going to die and you're going to have nothing. And you might be rich, but you're going to get buried next to a guy that's poor and you'll be the same, right? It's not worth it. And the Bible consistently, not just in Ecclesiastes, but all throughout warns us of the danger, especially of desiring riches, it speaks even of a danger of being rich. Jesus said it's hard for the rich man to enter the kingdom of God. But even stronger when it comes to that desire to be rich. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We've looked at a few different things in this passage throughout our study of Ecclesiastes. But look again with me at 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 9. The words before might be familiar. A few weeks ago we talked about, but godliness with contentment is great gain. But look at what it says at the end of that section, kind of the opposite of contentment. Verse 9 says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Warning, don't desire to be rich. It leads people to senseless and harmful desires and ruin and destruction. And God wants to keep you from that. The hard part of that for many of us is we think, well, yeah, I'm good there. I'm not desiring to be rich. Because most, almost nobody in this room thinks of themselves as rich. 
You, you think of rich people are people that have a lot more than you. And I only want a little more than what I have. So I don't, I'm not desiring to be rich, right? Because they have a lot more. And I'm okay if I just get a little bit more, right? We're fooling ourselves when we say that. I mean, for one, just the practical reason that pretty much everybody in this room is pretty filthy, stinking rich when you consider the whole world, all of history. You guys are all loaded, right? We all are, compar- comparatively. And so we are rich in this room. But also, we just need to think that's also not a biblical way to think, well, I'm okay because I just want a little bit more, where Solomon has been trying to tell us now for three into four chapters, be content with what you have, right? That that's where contentment is going to come from, not just settling for a little bit more, but being content with what God has given you, where the world is always wanting to get you to ask for more, more, more. If you just had more money, you would be happier. If you had a, a bigger house, you would be content, where that is not biblically true. And more is a very dangerous word. And that's where, again, we have to check our hearts because there might be a time where it's like, you know, I think it would be good to buy a bigger house or or something else, right? And that's where we need to prayerfully consider those decisions because if we're thinking, well, that will make me content, that's what the Bible wants to warn us against. And again, we, we need to think about our own culture. You know, we live in a very materialistic culture, in the United States of America, and I think even right now in the Treasure Valley, a place that's growing so much, a lot of people could be operating under this idea, well, if I just get more, then my life will be good. And the Bible's warning, warning, especially if your desire is to be rich and always wanting more, that's going to lead you into destruction and ruin and harmful and senseless places. And God wants to keep you from that. And God is saying, you know, what's more important than that is, is, is people. So even as you think through your own life, I mean, one place I think God would even want us to start, it starts there in Ecclesiastes. It mentions he doesn't have a son or a brother. It goes to family. What about every one of you when it comes to your family? Are you prioritizing them? And it's so easy for people to think and justify, well, I'm doing all this so I can get stuff for them. And especially parents in the room, be reminded what your kids need more than stuff is you, right? And if that starts to get in the way of that, that's going to create problems. One pastor commented well on this, I thought, just even in counseling, and you you realize this, you don't come across people, especially as they're young adults that are just really kind of messed up or grieved because it's, you know, my mom and dad, they they really loved me, they really cared about me, but, I, I mean, all we ever had was used cars, and I just don't know how I'm going to live life now, right? That's, that's never happened. But you do meet people that grew up, and they had everything they could have ever wanted. But there wasn't really a relationship in the home. There wasn't care in the home. And that creates problems downstream. So you can think about this, whether you're parents with kids or even grandparents with grandkids, or maybe some of you that are thinking now of your, your aging parents, And we can get so caught up on stuff when God has given you all of these relationships and all of them you only really get for a season. you got kids in your house right now, blink, and it's going to be over. You've got parents that are still alive. How much longer is that going to last? Treasure those things. Put a a biblical priority. Obviously, we can idolize those things to an extreme, but there, there is a biblical priority that all of those things should have. The goal is not just gain because that's just grabbing a fist of the mist. The goal is people. And as you think about, though, maybe getting back more into thinking about the workplace, God gives us some thoughts for that. Let's turn now to Colossians chapter 3. And again, it shows us it's not just about the paycheck. It's not just about the bottom line. Colossians 3 speaks to the bond servants and the masters. And I think in some ways... that. We can think of that in terms of, well, a lot of people here, you might be an employee, you're working for somebody, or you might be an employer, you've got people underneath you, and God wants to speak to both of them, saying, hey, there's a bigger priority than just the business, than just the profit. In Colossians 3.22, he says, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. There it gives us another thought. Our focus should be even on the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance 
as your reward. And there when it says don't work for men, I don't think it's saying don't work for men in the sense that your work should benefit others. It's warning us against, as it said earlier, the idea of working for men as a people pleaser and even just I'm working for them because they are a means to an end and that end is some kind of financial reward from them. I'm, I'm working them for a profit. No, I'm working for the Lord and trusting that he will bring the reward. There's more to work than just your paycheck. And then chapter 4 starts, Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Those of you that operate a business, there's a bigger thing going on than the bottom line. God cares about how you treat people, starting with your employees. And even any of you that have some kind of job, a good question to ask yourself would be, do you actually care about your customers or your clients? Do you view them as people or are they just a means to an end of you making money? One of those views, I think, is godly. The other, we're seeing, no, that's, that's leading you down a road that's going to lead to discontentment and destruction. And I'm not saying, hey, everybody has to work for some nonprofit organization, right? It's not wrong to run a business. And if you're running a business, well, then it should make a profit. And there's nothing unbiblical about charging a fair price. But there is something very ungodly about the goal of all of that being, I want to get rich. That is something God wants to warn us about. A more godly desire is, I want to serve God. I want to do something that's going to benefit other people. And I want to provide and support for the people that, I've, that God has given me in my life. Now, all that we've talked for is kind of actually familiar. I mean, how many movies could we come up with that this is the basic plot line? Some workaholic that realizes their job isn't going to fulfill them, and look at all these people that I've been ignoring, right? The list could go on. And so even Hollywood can get this right from time to time. And so we, don't, we want to do more than just see the, the problem. We want to get to what's God's solution for it. So let's keep going. Back in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, let's look at that next section Starting in verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. He's just starting off by reminding us there's something beautiful about sharing life with others. And as we're going to see, it's actually God's design. Even in business there, it's saying that there's, there's a reward that comes from sharing your work and your responsibility with somebody as opposed to just using it to get more for yourself. And then in verses 10 through 12, it gives us a bunch of pictures that should get us, especially when you think of them through the lens of the ancient world in which Ecclesiastes was written, just the ideas of protection and safety that come with companionship and partnership. Verse 10, for if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls. I think of someone on a journey at night, there's no street lights right? All you've got is the moon and the stars and it's dark and you fall into a ditch and you break your leg. Well, if you don't have anybody with you, you're in big trouble then. But if you've got somebody, they can help you. And even some of this, we see these ideas in our modern culture. Have you seen those commercials recently for the Apple Watch? You know, giving you this feature that, hey, if you're a mountain biker and you get in an accident, your Apple Watch can sense that and call 911 for you and look how it saved this guy. That's why the mountain bikers I know in this church, they, they like to do this together. Because if you fall, you've got a bro there with you. You don't need an Apple Watch, right? I've got a person that can help me in that situation. And then verse 11, if two lie together, they can keep warm. And you might think, that sounds kind of weird. But again, consider the ancient world. You're on a journey. It's, it's night. It's dark. It's cold. You huddle up around the campfire and you stay warm and healthy and alive. Or then verse 12, right, you've got two people. If, if robbers come while you're on this journey, well, if you've got two, you've got a better chance of defending yourselves as opposed to being alone. And then it, it sums it up with that beautiful saying there at the end of verse 12, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And that's where some of you might say, oh, yeah, I know this one. The third strand of the cord is God. And that's where I'm saying, well, that is a beautiful picture, and God should be at the center of our relationships, and they will be stronger and better for it. But I don't think that's what this verse means in its original context. I think it's just saying, man, look at all these benefits. Two are better than one. Add a third in there, it gets even stronger. 
and even keeps us from thinking about friendship just in terms of one person and one other person. But no, it can be even a, a group of people, three people specifically here. And some even view these verses as a beautiful picture of friendship, and I think it, it gives us that. But also, we think of friendship, I think, a lot in terms of our modern culture, and we think of friends as, well, those are people you do fun things with in your leisure time. Well, the people in this world, they did not know what leisure time is like modern Americans do. And notice all the pictures. It's really just about the business of life, not just of a friendship, but a partnership and really sharing even the day-to-day -day activities of life together. So let's put this down for point number two this morning. Prioritize the biblical need of partnership. Prioritize the biblical need of partnership. God says you need partners in life. You need people that you are doing, some, in some ways, sharing life with. People that can protect you. People that can help you. You are not designed to live this life alone. And some of that just goes back to, in very general terms, just humanity itself. Genesis 2, God looked at Adam and said, it is not good for man to be alone. So he created Eve, and we had the first husband and wife. And really, according to God's design, no one should be ultimately alone because you were meant to enter this world already with at least two people there for you, a mother and a father. And, and that structure of the family should be there to support you. We know there's ways that that can break down, sometimes just through tragedy in the fallen world, sometimes as a result of sin. But even in those situations, God says, I have a special place in my heart for those people, for the orphan, for the widow, for those that the, the family structure has broken down. God cares about them. But then notice, think about how God speaks of the Christian life. He loves to use that language of family to talk about Christians. I mean, God is our Father, and the most common word in the New Testament for believers is brothers. He's designed us as Christians to live as a family. And even another image he gives us in the New Testament for believers and for churches is that of a body, something that is connected. So as we think about this point, prioritize the biblical need of partnership, well, we need to realize two important truths. And that's where some of you might need to hear one of these truths more than the other, but we both, we all need both of them. And those truths are you need other people. And the other is kind of the flip side of that. Other people need you. And like I said, some of you might need to hear one of those more than the other this morning. But God is calling us to step into both of those realities. You need other people. And other people need you. Let's kind of start thinking think a little bit about that first one. You need other people. You will not be the kind of faithful and fruitful Christian that God wants you to be without other believers in your life because you need the help of other people. And again, that goes back to that image of the body in 1 Corinthians 12. It says, you know, the eye can't say to the hand, well, I have, I have no need of you, right? You know, you need that. And the hand can't say to the eye, well, I don't need you. I mean, just go home this morning, do a quick experiment and close your eyes and try to, you know, find something and pick it up. How's that going to go? Well, not well. Something's going to get spilled. So maybe don't actually try that at home, right? You, you need your eyes for your hands to know what they're doing. Well, try it the other way. You know, tie your hands behind your back and try to pick up something, right? Have you ever tried to pick up something with your eyelid before? It doesn't work out very well, right? We need the different parts of the body. And so you need other people. But then the, the flip side of that is other people need you. And often people forget that, forget the, that other people in, even in this church need your involvement in their life. Again, we can start with your, your family, your, your physical family that God has given you. Are, are you supporting them, your spouse, your children, your parents, whoever else that may be? In your life. But then what about your church family? Do you realize there's other people that need you? And even you might be thinking a lot about your family, and obviously there's an importance and there's a place for that, but are you mindful even of people in the church that might not have the family support that you have? 
They might be more isolated in that situation. What about people who are single or, or widows or situations like that? What about those that they have a family, but it's not maybe a strong family like you have? Are you thinking of them? And you might be thinking, well, man, I've got a great three, three-fold core that you know, I've got some good friends, and it's easy to kind of start thinking, well, I've got mine. I'm good. Or you might forget, well, there's someone else that, that's out there that's not attached to someone else, and they need that encouragement. And that's where we've got even these two realities where some of you really need to realize, hey, you can't go it alone. You need other people. And some of you that kind of need to be pushed into, you know what, other people need you. So if you feel like, well, I'm good, well, well, there's other people that might not be that need your help. What's the path forward? How do we actually make it as a church where we're living out this, these beautiful pictures in Ecclesiastes 9 or 4, 9 through 12? And that's why if you came to church today, thinking when I open my bulletin, there'll be one sheet of paper. Today, there are two. So if you didn't look at that other one yet, go ahead and pull it out. Because what we have done is we have printed up for you all of the one another passages in the New Testament. All over the New Testament, it uses this one Greek word that's translated into the two English words, one another. And it gives us God's path forward to build these kind of partnerships, these kind of relationships in the church. Now let's look at a few. If you want to look at them with me, the top left passage on your page should be Mark 9, 50. And if it's not, just flip it over to that side and then go down to kind of the middle of that first column and you'll see three references to Romans chapter 12. And the first one says this, Romans 12, 5. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. If you notice that one, it doesn't even have a command in it. It's just a statement. It's not saying, hey, guys, be a body. It's saying, listen up, you are a body. So the question is, are you going to be a healthy one or a paralyzed one? What do you want to be? And think of your physical body. Let's start with that picture. Would you rather have a healthy physical body or a paralyzed one? What do you think? Healthy, right? Don't you want all the parts of your body To work? Do you want to have to limp through life physically? No, you want it all working. Okay, well, what kind of church body do you want to have? A healthy one or a paralyzed one? And that means, okay, if we all want healthy, which I'm assuming, hey, we're unanimous in that we want a healthy church body, we need to remember it takes all of us doing our part. This church needs you. I mean, if I could go individually down every row and point at you, I would say, hey, this church needs you, all of us, if we're going to be healthy like God wants us to be. Okay, this church needs me to do what? Well, let's look at some more of these. Romans 12, 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Well, let's start with loving each other and caring about each other like brothers or sisters. And then outdo one another. That almost makes me think of you know, competition. I, are you competitive? I'm, I'm a pretty competitive guy. Get me involved in some kind of competition. You might see a new side of me come out, right? This is almost playing off that, hey, guys, you want to be competitive about something? Outdo one another in showing honor. Who, who can be the most loving, most serving, most encouraging person at this church? Feel challenged. I've dropped the gauntlet. Let's see what you can do this week. But we know, of course, the goal of that isn't ultimately selfish because we see that and look at the next Romans reference, Romans 12, 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. So again, the goal isn't to puff ourselves up because this is even reminding you, hey, it's not about being haughty. Associate with the lowly. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to see someone in this church that you might not think has anything to offer you in return, maybe even in the areas of a friendship or relationship, but you, you want to reach out to them and you want to encourage them and you want to build them up. This is what God wants us to do to be that healthy body. Look at the other column, kind of right across from that in the middle, Galatians 6 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Whose burdens are you bearing besides your own? And whose who are you sharing your burdens with? 
And even the context there is not just necessarily of physical burdens, it's spiritual burdens. Because the verse before that says, if any of you is caught in a trespass, let those of you who are spiritual restore that person. So are, are you willing to help someone through the sin in their life and be patient and helpful in that? That's what God is calling us to. Go down to the bottom of that column, Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Consider others more significant than yourselves. Every time you come to church or your small group or to serve somewhere, God is calling you to think, I am the least important person in the room. And how can I treat all these other people like they are more significant than me? And that will lead to things if you flip your page over there and go to the middle of the left column, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. It says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Well, what does that look like for you? Who are you going to encourage this week? Who can you build up? And that's where this can be hard to apply because there, you just look around the room and there are so many different personalities, so many different you know, circumstances or so many different backgrounds and experiences in the room. How do we kind of speak to all that? Well, on the one hand, you probably have people here who even through this church feel like, man, I feel more connected and supported as a Christian than I ever have in my entire life. And then you might also have other people right here in the room this morning that feel like, you know what, I've been coming to this church for a while and I feel alone. And then we've got people here that are, you know, huge extroverts, right, and just feed off environments like this. And others of you out there that it's like, it took all morning to gear up to come to church and it's going to take all afternoon to gear down, right, because you're an introvert. And we have all these different personalities. And so what, what does it look like? And even this is still a pretty young church, I was talking to somebody after the, the last service, and they were like, I'd been here for three weeks and you know, hadn't really met anybody, didn't feel like somebody was saying hi to me, so I said hi to the person next to me, and they were newer than I was, right? That's not uncommon at a church where so many people are moving to this community, and our church keeps growing. So when we've got all these different people from all these different backgrounds, personalities, you have different experiences, preferences, how do we do this? And that's where I think this is, this is what we got right here, the one another's. And will you be faithful just in whatever God has put in front of you this week to say, hey, I'm going to encourage somebody and I'm going to build up somebody this week. I don't think I've ever been a part of a church. And you know what? I know I never will be a part of a church that can say, we're doing this perfect. Because guess what? When we're doing this perfect, that's going to be heaven, right? Where the community will be all that it should be. But until then, we're always going to have room to grow. And when everybody here leaves saying, all right, other people are more important to me. Who can I share a burden with? Who can I encourage and build up? And how can I show somebody honor this week? That's when we will get healthier and grow and be the body that God wants us to be. And even if you are one that feel like, I'm, I'm lonely here, I would encourage you, well, first and foremost, lean on what you have in Jesus Christ. And then faithfully step forward and say, well, I'm going to try to be there for somebody else, even if I feel like there's nobody that's there for me. And that is hard. How do we do that? I mean, any of us, we're so wired to think me, me, me. How can we think of others? Well, it really all is going to get back to our relationship with Jesus Christ. We will not be a healthy body if really all of us are thinking, I am an empty cup that needs to be filled up by others, because then we'll always be looking for something from somebody else. But when we realize, well, I've got Jesus, and Jesus said, whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow a spring of living water. Well, man, I'm ready to pour myself out, because ultimately, I'm not needing something from others. I've got what I need in Jesus. And when we think that way, I think we'll find more of these healthy partnerships and even friendships within the church. Hopefully we'll see a lot of three and four and five strand or two strand cords in this church of people who are practicing the one another's, partnering with one another, sharing burdens, encouraging one another, loving one another with brotherly 
affection. Like I said, this isn't a perfect science. We've all got room to grow in this. And our last part of our passage will remind us some of the isolation that happens in communities or even in churches can be self-inflicted. And I think we're going to see some examples of that in the last portion. If you look at verses 13 through 16 again, you see this kind of interesting story that really revolves around two different characters. You've got this poor, wise youth, and you've got this old and foolish king. And I think we're going to see in each of those characters a a warning here. It says that the old foolish king, he doesn't know any longer how to listen to advice. He, He won't listen to anybody anymore. And it seems that maybe even partly because of that, he's going to lose his kingdom to this poor, wise youth who has seemingly gone from prison and poverty now to the throne. And this young guy, he's going to be immensely popular. Verse 16, there's no end of all the people of whom he led. But even that popularity is going to fade. Political popularity is fickle. And if last week you felt like, hey, I took some shots at the government, well, this one reminds us the citizenry doesn't have it all figured out either because they can be up and down and all over the place in their thinking and their desires. And so you see this Poor, wise youth who's going to be king and this old, foolish king, neither of them are alone in a literal sense. It seems that actually they're both surrounded by people, but they all experience what I would call a practical isolation, where where they might have people around them, but practically they are isolating themselves. Let's put this down for point number three. Beware the dangers of practical isolation. And what are those dangers? Well, we're going to see kind of one lesson from each of these characters in verses 13 through 16. The obvious lesson from this old foolish king is he doesn't know how to listen to anybody anymore. Well, that's something we can all struggle with from time to time. We can forget how to take advice. And for some of you, that looks like just not seeking counsel at all. You're not seeking others' input as you make decisions or think through things in your life. And that's not necessarily all nefarious. Some of it just comes as you mature as a person. You want to be independent in a right way and making your own decisions and not just waiting around for somebody to tell you what to do. There's good that comes from that. But if we take that so far where I'm not even going to listen to other people, I'm not even going to seek advice We've gone to what the Bible would say is a dangerous place. And how many Proverbs speak to that? Here's one, Proverbs 15, 22. Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. But then another way to practically isolate yourself, even in that realm of ignoring counsel like this king, is really only listening to the counsel that already agrees with what you already think. You ever done that or seen that? I I think I should do this. Let me ask somebody. Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? I think that's a horrible idea. Oh, okay, thanks. Person number two. Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. I I don't know about that. Maybe you should pray. Okay, person three, four, five says the same thing, but person six, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. See, godly counsel right there, right? And we have our own bias in the situation of what we already think, where sometimes we need to step back and say, okay, yeah, but most people are saying this is not wise. Maybe I should stop and think about that and listen to that. But one thing I I think may be the most problematic and popular is starting to believe this idea that nobody understands me. I can't listen to anybody and nobody can speak to my life because nobody understands me. Can't you see the king doing that? Well, these guys, they don't don't understand the pressures that I face and, and they don't understand what it's like to be king. Well, what good is their counsel? And maybe you're going through something. You're like, well, no one's gone through exactly what I've gone through, or yeah, these other ladies in the church are talking to me, but they don't have to be married to him, right? All these different things that you might say, well, nobody understands me. And that's where on one level, that's usually not accurate, and there's a lot of false assumptions there. There also can be some legitimately difficult and even hurtful past experiences that you have. Maybe some of you have been burned by Job's friends, you know, so to speak where you were going through something really hard and you had people that showed up and gave you bad counsel. And you're like, I don't need any more of that in my life. And so you start to say, well, people don't understand me. But that's where we need to realize, no, God still says I need 
other people. And you know what? I should weigh their advice and consider it. But even in that circumstance, I would encourage you, make sure you're evaluating it through the lens of God's word and not just your feelings. Because sometimes our feelings are leading us astray and godly counsel is going to be one of the things that turns us away from that. So don't put yourself, I mean, you are isolating yourself when you tell yourself, well, no one understands me. Well, then no one is going to be able to help you. That's going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's not going to help you. You need other people, and even we need the counsel and advice of other people. So that's one way to practically isolate yourself. The other is really, I think, seen in this picture of this young prince or this young poor person that will become the king. And there we we see that he becomes immensely popular. And that might not be something you feel like you can relate to. You're like, I ain't no king. I ain't no senator or president. Like, I don't have this mass following, so I, don't, I can't relate to that. But it does seem that he's got a lot of people in his life. But the question is, is there any, is there any depth? Is there really anyone to pick him up when he falls? Or, or someone to keep warm? Or someone to protect each other? And that's maybe where more people in the room can relate, where you're like, I got people in my life. Look, this room seems pretty full. Look at all these people I got in my life. Well, do you know any of them? Do you love any of them? Are you bearing any of their burdens? Right? Well, we need that depth in our relationship. Or maybe for some of you, you get to a point where God does give you some influence. And maybe through work or through ministry, you have some level of success and you gain some kind of following. Well, be careful. There's some dangers that can come with, with that. And just thinking, well, look at all these people. I must have the relationships and not realizing, well, that can be fickle and that can't replace having people in your life. There was one politician, he ran for president a couple times, didn't win, but the second time he ran, his whole campaign went down in a blazing fire of scandal and sexual scandal and financial scandal, not a great scene. And people that were close to him even reflected on the change they saw in this person, where the first time he ran for president, when it came to go out and greet the crowds, it was kind of roll his eyes like, yeah, they love me, realizing, yeah, I don't know. These people don't really know me. I don't know them, right? But then the second time around, when it came out to greet the crowds, it was like, oh, yeah, they love me, right? And he was starting to buy into all the hype, even as his whole life was imploding. If God ever puts you in that situation, realize no, popularity isn't all it's cracked up to be, and it definitely cannot replace the kind of partnership that we saw in verses 9 through 12. So really think through, who are you practicing the one another's with? And let it start with you. This church will be healthy when each of us are saying, how can I grow in this? How can I make this church a stronger, healthier body? And we'll think that way when we as Ecclesiastes is teaching us to do, prioritize people over stuff or over ourselves.